Oh, is he? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't really work on Can't fly this plane until we. No. This plane no. will not take off until we have a minute taker. Coffee maker. 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 Coffee maker
So I hit one. No, I, I just went for lunch to some place, and it was a brewery, but it was not a very wide selection. Well, I went to Brewtopia. Yeah, um, it was okay. It was okay. Um, you know, just typical bar food. Very local crowd, which I thought was interesting. I thought this was a good one. You know, travel in downtown. It was three brass brasses. Ah, okay. Yes. They had some interesting food. Right around the corner from the If if you're a lager drinker, it was not. Uh, not a great. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Thanks. You can come stay. <laughs> she wasn't here to tell us that we're supposed to get her started for real. Also, Jeff waited until we had the note taker, so we can get started now. Jeffrey, <laughs> thank you. We appreciate you being the note taker. As always, you're the best note taker we've ever had. You're the best, Jeffrey. No, we got one. Mike McBride right. is volunteer. Um, okay. And I want to make that publicly known that we we really appreciate you in every way. Yes. Yeah. Yes. All right. <laughs> All right. You think we should start now? Start up. Jeffrey's here, so we can start. All right. Welcome to PIM. I'm, no. <laughs> Sorry. Welcome to M Bone D. This is M Bone D. Uh, here is the note well. Please note it well. Um, folks on the uh, Meet Echo, we see Dale, Jake, Kerry, Lorenzo, Lucas, and Natalie. Um, can you guys hear us? Yeah, this is the widest audience we've ever had remotely, at least for a while. That is a yes. Okay, from any of from those people. Okay, great, cool. All right, uh, here's our agenda. Uh, we're gonna s switch things around slightly. Um, you want to uh, full screen that? Yeah, I was gonna try to find the document. Okay. All right. Oh, there we go. That's, yes, okay, cool. Um, we'll get there. <laughs> um, so uh, this is the agenda, um, a fairly full agenda. It's a good thing we got our own room now um, because we're gonna, we're gonna use it, um, uh, our own session. Um, and, uh, oh yeah, blue sheets, that's a good point. Yeah. These are the blue sheets. Be sure to sign them. Put the front page. Mm. Yeah. Okay. All right. Please sign the blue sheets. Um, Hitoshi's here to talk about M-Trace, and uh, he has some late breaking news that we're excited to hear about, I'm sure. Um, Mike has a couple presentations on uh, update and um, new beer entropy. Um, Jake's gonna be presenting remotely. Um, we're, we're probably gonna move Natalie up right before Jake uh, to, promote, to, pro, um, to present remotely. Um, and then Torless has a couple uh, presentations. Um, so let's see, next slide. All right, um, so of our active working group documents, we have mTrace, which has been stuck for a while uh, with security issues at IESG. Um, and Hitoshi's gonna provide us an update. Hopefully he has figured out a way to unstick those. Um, we have the uh, deploy draft, uh, that or the data center deploy draft. Mike's gonna provide an update on that. Um, Mike, do you want to tell us what's going on on the um, MCAST problems, problem statement draft? Uh, we haven't, uh... Mike McBride, we didn't do any updates since the last ITF on that uh, 
eight, uh, IEEE 802 uh, multicast problem statement. So we didn't ask for a slot this time. Um, so I'm not exactly sure. Uh, probably what we'll do is we'll probably do another up update before Bangkok mm -hmm. presented there. Um, I think we'll probably be pretty close at that time to ask for a working group last call. Cool. Uh, and then the Yang models draft uh, was adopted successfully since uh, London. Um, so uh, Sandy, is Sandy here? No, no Sandy. Um, that's ready to be, you know, reissued as a working group document. Um, so after a while, you know, took a while, but now we're a working group document. So we're ready for that. Um, other drafts, uh, there's the deprecate draft, which is actually in a current ongoing um, call for adoption. Uh, so uh, we, will, we, we would really appreciate folks replying to that adoption call, either yay or nay, if you think it should or should not be adopted. Um, Toriless is going to uh, provide an update on that one. Um, there is the AMBI draft that Jake is going to provide an update um, that he's going to present. Tell us all about, and then there's the um, beer entropy uh, data center draft that Mike Jurong is or, uh, are going to present. Okay, so first up, Hitoshi. Um, yeah. Now I did post your latest slides, but. Uh, I also posted the latest slides in the agenda slide, and it wasn't the latest, so it's possible that it didn't get updated. Uh, so be prepared for it not being their latest slides. I go back. Do the M trace one. Yeah, it's missing stuff. Let's go to the other web page. Where's the data track? Go, click on the M bone D agenda one. Yeah, right there. Yeah. Yep. Let's click on that. Did that not do anything? No, that's not it. Can you go back? Go click back on the agenda. Yeah, but. Just try it. It might. Oh, yeah, you're right. Hmm. How do you get to this page? You have to be in the materials page. It's usually the right side of this. Right? It says materials. And it's not showing it here because I'm not logged in. So I'm not going to log in this Yeah, but it might. Um... It's good thing we have extra time. Right? The working group or the. Hey, stupid uh, working group chair question. Sure. Um, would MBONE D actually, you know, do the work for any operational document related to beer? Actually, it's a good question. That's come up before, and uh, I, I believe it would it would apply. I don't think there's any, anything in our charter that prevents But we it. haven't seen anything yet, right? So operational. No, we haven't had any ops requirements. I mean, it, I envision it'll happen. It's part of the discussion came up. In like, what does beer do now that it's got? I'm just trying to stall here, so it's fine. If this okay. <laughs> All right, no need to stall. No, but that's an interesting conversation. That's actually a good question about beer, uh, but maybe we'll save that for when Mike, because th there is a good question, and maybe you can give us a, at the end. Mm -hmm. sure. What is the state of beer, and are there operational considerations sure. that we should be providing here? I'll shoot from him. I can leave that one. Uh, Hitoshi, I think this is you. Now it's a 
have a previous year. Well, um, we started, so this is not a cat. This is a history. Is that how yeah, turn it on. Yeah, no, it's on. Okay, so this is a history of our uh, status. So we studied the ISG review on uh, January 20, so this year. And uh, the budget was 22, and uh, we got uh, several comments from ISG, and uh, we revised the based on the several comments and uh, uh, submitted 20, version 23 uh, on April to address all comments, uh, but mainly monormative wordings or ion related things and so on. So, except uh, media and ELIC all approved, I believe, but we had uh, uh, still uh, comments from media and ELIC, and uh, we revised based on their comments and submitted uh, version 24 in June uh, to address their comments. And uh, media approved, but ELIC couldn't. So we have been working to fulfill the requirements uh, ELIC showed. And uh, so today I just briefly summarized the uh, status and uh, the current situation. And they go to the next, but uh, bef maybe just go to the last slide is better. The last slide, last slide, last one. So actually, this is update on this uh, at this morning. So we thought after Eric's comment confirmation and approval, we will submit uh, uh, new new vision twenty five and ask the final procedure. But uh, I met him this morning, and uh, finally I got. Uh, uh, his confirmation and approval. So uh, now I'm uh, uh, think I believe uh, uh, we can uh, submit the revised version, and the that revised version will be approved by all ISG. So this is a uh, current news. But so uh, if there is no consensus and uh, there is no approval, I may uh, want to ask you how we can uh, address this comment and how we unstack the current situation, but luckily uh, uh, I got a consensus and a approval. So actually, as a result, maybe I don't need to ask what should I do now, but anyway, I can summarize what we have been working. So in the previous slide, you have some question or comment? Yeah, uh, Stig, no, I was just gonna ask you, yeah, if you were, would say something about what you had to change, what was needed. Sure, sure, of course, or... yeah. So. This is just a result. I, I I think it's better to show the final result. But uh, now I think it's yeah yeah it's great. So, but let's go back to the page maybe three. You, you removed all the suspense now. Now let's. <laughs> <laughs> we go back to the beginning of the uh, page three. Yes, this one. So the his comment mainly his comment has uh, he has two comments. Uh, one is forgery of responses, and so it's mainly security related stuff. Forgery of responses and amplification attacks. And uh, he said, this program does not appear to verify that sender of the request uh, actually owns the IP claims. So anyway, so no, no, keep, keep it up. Yeah, this one. And uh, because the responses are much larger than the queries, this allows for application attack, especially in the, if the client is able to send a query or request that in the smart price. And uh, because the query ID is so short, an attacker can, can generate for us. Okay. Well, so he requires something like a longer query ID, but uh, we already re replied that the query ID is not intended as a security protection mechanism, so the the length of the query ID is meaningless to protect something uh, from the security threats. So the first part is actually the main point. So uh, we updated, uh, based on his comment, we updated the forgery of responses. So, well, uh, he may require something like an encryption mechanism 
for the messages, but uh, we don't want to adapt some special encryption mechanism. Maybe it can be, but uh, that kind of specification could, could be uh, specified in a different uh, documentation. So we don't want to say the encryption mechanism is something like a must or should. So we explain that encryption mechanism could be fine, but uh, that kind of part is uh, out of the scope of this document. And uh, he understands this part. The second part, this is more sensitive. So filtering of clients. And, so see, this one is a version 24. This includes the version, this section, subsection is included in version 24. And also in 25, we uh, slightly modify the wording from 24. Uh, the LED, car, LED fonts uh, explain the differences from the 20, version 24. And uh, uh, the answer, the reply from us is that uh, we uh, should um, specify some uh, configurable packet filtering mechanism is must. So because uh, maybe it's better to explain with an uh, example. So let's say uh, we have one client and uh, this client is attached to router A and router A is upstream with router B and router C and so on. And uh, at the router C attached to the sender. In that case, loud, uh, clients send a QLA messages legally. So he is a valid member, he sent a query message and Lauta A uh, accept his query and uh, translate this query as a new request message. So request message is transferred from A to B and then B to C. And then C change the header part or the message type from uh, the request to reply and send back to the client. This is ordinary case. But his concern is if the valid receiver is attached to, let's say, router B. And router B um, intentionally or unintentionally sends a request packet, not a QLA packet, request packet. But router B only approved his IP address, so he send the, this request message to upstream routers. But in that case, request message may have some problems, so for example, over the MTU or something. Then the uh, ELA message is transmitted to the original client, which is attached to router A. So this is something like a amplification attack, he said. So this, this is amplification, uh, amplification attack, he says. So this kind of uh, uh, attack or intentional or unintentional attack cannot be, uh, pro, uh, cannot be uh, protected by any mechanism which is because uh, by any previous mechanism. But to protect this kind of attack, uh, we uh, specify configure packet filtering mechanism is must. This means that uh, the router should also recognize uh, type value as well as IP address and port number. Then the router think that this request message must not be given by his downstream nodes, even though he is a valid member. This kind of uh, uh, intentional or unintentional uh, message must be dropped at the router B. Otherwise, router B just believes his request message, which must be diff must be strange, and the transfer transfer to the upstream router. So to uh, protect this kind of attack, uh, we should provide some configurable packet filtering mechanisms that uh, supposed to verify the IP address, port number, and also the type value of the messages. Uh, it's just a, um, I got lost a little bit. Um, so does the filtering need to happen only in the actual entries uh, client or like in the entries code, like the processing code? Or are you saying that a router that is kind of just on the path to the IP destination will need to do some filtering? Say again. Um, yeah, basically, I'm trying to understand. Okay. Um, is it just like um, when a router processes an mtrace packet, mm -hmm. like as part of being an mtrace client or server, or whatever, that you can do this filtering, or do you expect like a router that forwards IP packets to see, oh, this is an mtrace packet, I need to maybe drop it. Well, the client, which means and the hosts, only can initiate QLE not to request yeah, or yeah. reply, okay? Yeah. But uh, uh, let's say there's some valid or invalid 
client, which is just a host, not a router, may send a reply or request message. This is something a bogus. Uh, uh, this is a something like attack. Right. And in that case, the problem is let's. So this is a little bit complex. So the um, if the query um, the request, uh, let's say, okay. So the first the send the client send a query and the query sent to uh, query packet is now transferred to this request by router and this request is hop by hop transmitted to our sender okay mm -hmm. but uh, in that case the request include uh, add the appended append the uh, response block so the packet size will be increased hop yeah. by hop yeah. and in that case in the middle of the pass the packet may encounter the MTU limitation. In that case, the current packet, request packet, is transmitted to the original clients and uh, continuously eliminate by eliminating the uh, previous uh, standard response blocks, only keeping the uh, message header, which wh whose type is a request, uh, continuously transmitted toward the sender. But his concern is if the message itself is really larger or the empty itself is really small along the path, then the um, un incomplete uh, reply message may uh, be transmitted uh, by each router several times. Okay. So even though the the client send a one single query yeah. message, yeah. he may receive the multiple replies, which is initiate, uh, it, which it is created by the intermediate routers. This may, so this is an amplification attack he yeah, named. Sure. Yeah. So to avoid this kind of attack, intentionally or unintentional attack, uh, request message must be uh, originated by intermediate router, not the any host. Okay, so <clears throat> so I think then in, in, in the, um, basically when you implement M trace as part of your M trace processing code, you have to implement some kind of check to see. If yes, it's, yes, if it's yes, not certain, not exactly, case. exactly. But if it's just some random router that just see this packet on the wire, the wire it doesn't have to do anything, I would think. My, my concern is, you know, when you say like packet filtering, and stuff it kind of sounds like it's like an acl that drops the packet like you know and it's not on the wire but this is actually in the m trace code i think well but this is actually the uh really similar to the le ordinary regular access control acl mechanism the difference is that acl only uh support to uh filter the ip address and port number but as well uh, the message type must be also checked. Yeah, yeah my, my concern is, you know, um, I don't think you would get all, all routers on the internet to have the capability of, of filtering packets based on, on the... This is his requirement. But if someone implements mtrace version 2, then they can certainly implement code that can check, okay, is this IP address an okay address? Right. So is it sufficient to do the latter thing that the only the routers that implement MJS version 2 need to filter packets? But I heard from uh, Kerry's now, no, I think so he's... Kerry's trying to... Yeah. Okay. So he said there is some uh, uh, vendors implementation corresponding to this kind of filtering stuff. Uh, Cisco or Juniper. So he, he may say something. Kerry, if you want to speak. Is there something we need to do for him it's to speak? Okay, I can try to look at it later and understand it. Can we... Just click it. <laughs> Just keep up. Oh. Okay. Oh, yeah. So, so anyway, anyway, he he said uh, there is such kind of implementation, the the something like a common implementation. 
to filter out the based on the message type or something. So that can that kind of uh, filtering mechanism can be adapted to, uh, for this kind of but, schema. Yeah. But at least though, it might mean that you need to upgrade all the routers with new code that well, can do this, even if they are possibly, not explicitly, possibly. you know, need to support m -trace. Possibly. But anyway, so this is, uh, and uh, also, Okay, so okay, so anyway, if you don't agree this kind of uh, sentence, please uh, say in the mailing list or so it, uh, is this I, what Eric required yep. in order to get thumbs yep. up? Yep. Okay. Yep. And Stig, you're you're um, not agreeing. You you have concerns that it requires all the routers to upgrade, but do the that the routers have mtrace v2 working now anyway yeah so at least in in practice i mean you could say people must implement some filtering to support that the spec right to be compliant with whatever the rfc will be mm -hmm. and you can say okay if you support if you implement mtrace you need to be compliant of course but it's uh, you know it's hard to enforce and say that all routers that are deployed need to support mtrace filtering and if that is needed to make it secure, then in practice, it you know you can't really expect that to happen. Okay, but this is mtrace v2, and do yeah. does mtrace v2 don't they need to upgrade in order to support this? I mean, you need to upgrade. Of course, when you are doing the trace, each router on the path with the beginning of the trace towards the destination need to support mtrace. Okay. But you need also routers then between the client and those routers to also, you know, they will forward a packet as well, either the, the, the query or the responses. Ah. And I'm wondering, do they need to support filtering? Okay. But um, maybe it's worth taking that to the list just so we can continue on. How did they say how to grant him the floor? Oh, uh, uh, oh. oh, okay. <laughs> it's a great big red button, but it's not labeled. No, it looks dangerous. See, <laughs> seems like you shouldn't okay. use the big red button. Hi, Kelly. Okay. Go, Carrie. You, you can speak. Hi, can, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. So there's, there's, a, there's, there's standard, standard functionality function. that's, I'm sorry, was someone just talking? Okay, there's standard functionality that is supplementary to ACLs that's provided by uh, Juniper and Cisco and I assume other vendors that provides generic packet filtering uh, and it allows specification of an arbitrary field within the payload, which in this case could be the mtrace message type. So this isn't a special thing um, required as part of the mtrace implementation. It's just there uh, for um, current releases of, of a number of vendors routing and switching products. Uh, Thales Eckert, um, I guess arbitrary within the data wouldn't even be necessary, right? I hope that the message type is somewhere in the first, what is it, 32, 64 bits or so of the message. That's typically what I remember everybody supports. Yeah, that's right, Torlis. So, so it's um, within a, a, not arbitrary, but some number of bytes of the header, which in this case will work fine. We, we can differentiate uh, request and, and reply from other message types. So we, we can say only these ranges of IP addresses are allowed to send a request and or a reply message. So, Kerry, just to understand, this is Stig again. So, so it's not sufficient to filter this when you process a query or a response, you actually need to filter it when you forward the packet. Yes. Okay. So, so it's a, a per interface required configuration on routers that are being used for mtrace. 
onion rockets used for M-Trace. Correct. So, so the configuration, although the you know functionality would, I assume it's there on all the routers in the network. Um, this filtering only needs to be configured on routers that will be participating in M-Trace. Okay, that's great. But doesn't that mean now that uh, just as part of normal M-Trace um, processing, you can say, oh, did this message come from an acceptable IP address? So uh, at first, that's what we were thinking. So we were just going to provide ACL filtering. But there was a amplification attack scenario um, that Eric um, suggested that really requires us to additionally filter it by message type, um, which is that we have a allowed routing peer that has been explicitly enabled by IP address. But instead of sending a request, uh, I, I, instead of, or I, I'm sorry, we have a client that, that is allowed to send requests. Uh, and the, the client uh, uh, sends, I'm sorry, it's allowed to send queries, and the client sends a request instead. Yeah, but um, that, that mean, though, that all you do is, you know, in, in the, um, your m uh, implementation, you just check, okay, this is like query, does it come from one of the allowed queries? Or if it's a response, does it come from an acceptable, um, um, yeah, whatever the word is. You see what I mean? When you process the m message, of course, you know what type of messages it is. So you can make that decision. Um, so and, maybe, maybe for clarification, and maybe that helps with, with Stig's question. So try to remind me if these packets that we need to filter are guaranteed to be at the process level because they've been punted by router alert or something else, or can they be in the hardware forwarding plane and need to be filtered there? So we want to prevent them from even getting punted. Um, the, the reason for using the filtering mechanism is we would prefer not to even interrupt the CPU with with um, disallowed packets like this. Um, we're we're quickly running out of time. Uh, we've we've eaten all the extra time that we had um, for this. So yeah. Um, so uh, can we can we take some of these things to the list and can you quickly go through the other yeah, the other yeah yeah yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Maybe summarize them because actually a lot this of is the most uh, tough part. Actually, okay. so ne next one is just an uh, explanation about what is application attack, and uh, this is also related to the uh, such kind of filtering mechanism. So PIM itself, for example, PIM SM or PIM and so on, uh, has a mechanism to uh, authenticate the neighbor routers. So in addition to the such kind of filtering mechanism, PIM router, this one says should stop any emptors to request or reply messages that is received from a uh, non uh, authorized uh, PIM neighbors. And uh, additionally, this is uh, today's uh, uh, agreement. So, this initially we did, didn't mention this kind of a scenario because m doesn't rely on any kind of multicast routing protocol, but uh, he requires such kind of uh, authentication mechanism. So, as an example, we explain about the PM authentication mechanism, but not only PM, we also need to explain the intent of this text is to prevent non louder endpoint from uh, implementation of non PM protocol should employ some other mechanism to prevent this kind of attack. So if you use uh, uh, non PM louder, then something like a similar mechanism must be uh, considered. Okay, Stig again, I just want to say quickly, so, you know, it's great that he, he accepted this and maybe we can, you know, be fine with it. But I think we need yeah, to spend a little bit time in the working group just to make sure that what actually was agreed on is practical to implement. So, so the, the hostages have been agreed to be released, but um, we're not quite sure we, we agree with the terms <laughs> of, the, of the release. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I think I, I think it goes without saying we, we should definitely uh, send things on list when people have a chance to really review and and um, and, and uh, digest what was agreed to make sure that it didn't um, change anything. Okay. So but, we, we will submit uh, anyway twenty yeah. budget twenty five, and then after submission, then please label the newest yeah. uh, version and. Uh,
Yeah, the 20 I, think of, I think at this stage in the process, right, accept or propose something better, <laughs> right? So yes. just raising concerns, I think we're past that. Okay. okay. So hopefully, I mean, you know, it's like they say, the 25th draft is the charm, so. <laughs> That's just a little tough. Yeah. All right, Mike, come on down. Come on down, Mr. McBride. And, and thank you, Hitoshi, uh, for your grit and determination in getting through this <laughs> process of 25 different revisions. It's been a long journey. Very good. All right, so some of you may remember this draft from, um, thank you. From years ago, last time, last uh, ITF, I mentioned that um, it was resurrected. It was already a working group draft. We thought it would be a good idea to have a working group draft here in Embone that discusses multicast's use in the data center. Um, last ITF, I it was just me on the draft. I requested someone to join me, and that request was uh, granted by Olafemi from Arista. So he did a great job of fairly significantly updating this draft with some new information. Um, and doesn't actually work. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Just move on. It's just just move to the next slide. That's all there is anyway. No, yeah. All right. So um, basically what we added was things such as um, things that may not even be necessarily multicast related, but more one-to-many related, whatever that may be. So um, we address things like um, head-end replication. Um, we introduced just a few things that uh, in the future could be used uh, in the data center. Um, and this is where we would need to get your feedback here. And this is something that was mentioned at the beginning of this meeting. And that is that we included just a, a brief comment about multicast and segment routing. Um, we just mentioned that uh, in the spring working group, for instance, they are rechartering, but multicast continues to not be included in that charter. And so um, we need to have a place to address multicast in spring. We're addressing some of those things in PIM within MBOND, it'd probably be a good idea to start at least thinking about some and ramifications. And in, beer. and in beer, right, okay, very good. Um, and so um, we're addressing that, we're, we meant, we mentioned beer in this draft as well, just, you know, what's, what's being worked on, even though as far as I know, there's no beer deployments in a data center, is that a correct statement today? Would that be accurate? that you can talk about. <laughs> so that's not true. So there are beer deployments outside of data centers? Um, not okay. So should, should we be doing things like um, a, a problem statement or a requirements draft for beer in spring? I mean, for multicast in spring? Maybe so, maybe so. Cause we have, uh, we have, for instance, in PIM, a draft that's going to be uh, mentioned today. And we've had some that were discussed previously about different solutions uh, for multicast and in, in segment routing, whether that's beer or some new type of solution. Um, so maybe some of those things may need to be discussed from a deployment perspective here. It's a stick. Yes, I was wondering a bit what you want to do with this draft. Should you talk about you know what people have deployed, like best practices and stuff? Or should we talk about also like issues people see or like future technology possible new solutions? We kind of do a little bit of everything right now. Yeah, prior to this latest update from Femi, it was just what's been used today. Okay. Up to this point, where much is used, but we added a few just little tidbits that maybe we shouldn't. Of well, the, just just an FYI, there are some new developments that are being used. They're coming into deployments probably soon, just be aware of them. And if the, if the, when that does happen, here's some of the basic things to be aware of. Um, if that's something that, that, and that's what we've added. So that's kind of the question, if we think that that kind of information should be briefly mentioned in this draft as we've done, or left out entirely. Yeah, please, I don't have an opinion really. I mean, I think the document is good, but at least think about, yeah, well, what you want. Yeah, okay. I think we will focus on keeping it to what I just mentioned, that is 
current deployment of multicast and data centers. Um, but again, we can't help ourselves by at least mentioning some of these new technologies coming along. Um, so, yeah, so anyway, th we encourage people to look at it further. Um, we're not ready to ask for a working group last call. We're going to continue to develop this. We're in no hurry. But I think it could be useful, especially with this latest update. And um, any questions about that further? If anybody wants to join in on the fun, feel free to join us. Thank you. Oh, don't go anywhere. Oh, yeah. Is this you or? This will be me, know. yeah. Maybe both. We'll see. Let's see if it works. Oh, I see this is. Uh, no, it's not doing it. Oh, now you're presenting. All right, you're just gonna have to. You're just gonna have to. Does step three? Hmm. No. Does. So much for that Chromebook. Okay. <laughs> yeah, just keep pushing buttons. Actually, yeah. one of them works. Let's try this. Let's go back to this. Let's try that. I don't think we're going to use that Chromebook. <laughs> For our meetings. <laughs> yeah, it's really helpful. You're doing things we never thought we'd have to do. Hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Let's start. <laughs> try this again. And just keep it on that first slide if you get yeah, I mean, if it opens up. All right. Okay. Yeah. If you could actually go to the first slide, that would be helpful. Back there. Yeah, that's good. So hopefully you can see this. So, um, a few of us, including someone at uh, Alibaba, um, thought it would be helpful, per my previous comments, to um, address beer considerations in the data center, um, as beer is getting more popular, um, and as we discuss beer with customers. Uh, in some cases, we need to convince them of the, the benefits of beer and they understand, you know, the state saving and all that. Um, but we found that it would be helpful. And I think that's part of the Enbone charters to do these kind of deployment and consideration documents to just kind of help people have something to point to where this is what you'll get if you do use beer. And in this case, um, we, we could either have a beer, general beer in a data center draft mm -hmm. here in Enbone D or beer. Um, or we do like what we've done here, and that is we've just chosen a specific uh, feature of uh, beer, and then in this case, it's including entropy in beer for load balancing, um, and, uh, create just, a, and create a document about it. Yeah, I, just just for, for technical clarity, what you did was you selected a use case in the data center, and then looked at how to apply beer for that use case that's or right. that product. Exactly, that's exactly right. And that, so in the, just using that framework, that's kind of where M D belongs. In a, in a deployment mechanism for multi-point services. But you're presenting this in beer as well tomorrow, correct? Just for kicks and giggles, but yeah. And, and you should. I mean, we normally do that across across working groups to make sure everyone's informed. Clearly, the entire beer group is not represented here. People might have issues about how the entry field is. Work. I mean, I, I, I like where this is going. I don't necessarily agree with all the decisions because sure. I've got some uh, some feedback into this as well. We'll take the okay. rest of the room. Okay, that sounds good. All right. Um, so, okay, next slide. The problem statement. So, if we can get there, okay, very good. All right. So, um, yeah, I, I tried. Oh, it's that one, not that one. So this draft describes, and Jing Rong has been leading this, um, and this, these are his ideas, and I've just been kind of helping him uh, with some of the details of this. But we're describing how beer entropy can be useful in data center clause networks. So. 
Beer entropy, entropy in general is being used with a variety of protocols, including segment routing. There's a draft on entropy. I don't know the RFC number. Yell it out if you know it. But um, that allows you to do load balancing, and it can be done in a more uh, deterministic way rather than just more of a random hashing and ECMP kind of environments. Um, and beer includes entropy as well. So you can actually have, uh, as you look at a packet and look at the source IP, a destination address, and maybe the port numbers, you can uh, take that out and create an entropy label in an MPLS environment and, and hash on that. Just hold a second, just a question. I'm been trying to stay clear of data centers. There's so little uh, oxygen. But um, any any example of kind of the worst case multicast in terms of you know, to think of an application where, you know, getting this right is most important. Do you have one? No. Professional media. Okay. Or are you, like your description here, uh, Greg Shepard, Cisco, is not chair hat. Um, you said long live elephant flows. In PMN, they're mm -hmm. all elephant flows. And so uh, when you've got multi-point going up, multi-point come down, ECMP could create collisions based on the, the addressing hash, whereas you want to make sure that this flow takes this link and the next big flow takes this link and there isn't collisions across that. So is that typically kind of streaming out of the data center or kind of the kind all of processing within the DC. inside? All within the DC. So processing. For exactly. So okay. you've got, so. I mean, so even, uh, well, what we call a DC, and that could be in a truck, it could be in a stadium, it could be in a massive data center facility, but the, the flows are the same. They're all 4K HD cameras, yeah. and, and they stay that way, un, uncompressed flows. Yeah, I think the, the important part that you mentioned is the data center doesn't have to be the Alibaba <laughs> big sure. thing, right? But it can, can, can be arbitrarily low, small, and the smaller it gets, yeah, the more yeah. important. Yeah, you basically just, you've got um, leaf and spine. So, you know, two hop, you're trying to just do two hop deterministic ECMP paths. So. Yeah, that's exactly right. Exactly. So that's, and that's what a clause network is. And so um, without going into too much in detail on that, and we, we mentioned it in this draft, and I think I may mention it more in the DC deploy draft, and that is, you know, how we used to, for those of us who have been doing this for a long time, we used to have the hierarchical tree-like um, structure, tier one, tier two, tier three, which was core distribution and access, and we've kind of moved away from that. It's much more popular to do these uh, clause uh, spine leaf uh, scenarios where you've got tier one, tier two, tier three, the spine being tier one, uh, the leaf being tier two, and the top of rack being tier three. And it's more horizontally scalable. You can add new servers, devices, routers, whatever, to the spine as you need them without having to replace boxes. So it's just much more scalable and that's for port density. That's why we're doing it. Um, and we've, you know, kind of mentioned the the long lived elephant flows. They may affect performance of the short lived flows and reduce efficiency. Um, and there are some hash function inefficiencies in ECMP um, and you could have frequent flow collisions and more flows can get placed over one path uh, over the other. Um, and isolating faults with multiple parallel paths in a data center, where the, and there's a lot of them, can be non-trivial due to lack of determinism. And so we're trying to find, we're, we're trying to uh, specify that beer with entropy can give us a level of determinism uh, to help alleviate some of these problems. Um, and um, an operator may want to have a deterministic path. Um, and this, this is something that's being used elsewhere. There's a draft MPLS spring entropy label, um, which addresses very similar thing. We've utilized some concepts from that draft. Um, and so basically, um, a deterministic path can be found by using part of the 20 bit entropy field, um, bit zero to bit two, for instance, for instance, of the entropy label can be, can represent a value of zero to seven. It could be used to select deterministic paths from eight equal cost paths. So um, again, it's something that's not new to beer, but thankfully beer does uh, utilize it. It's mentioned in the beer drafts in not any particular great detail. And so in this draft, we intend that if this is just the first stab at it, but we intend to provide some of more of that detail of how you could use this in a data center network. Um, any questions so far? Okay, so I'm just going to uh, quickly go through the next two the slides. It just kind of it just kind of shows what I just described in this, and these diagrams are used in the uh, in the draft. So, um, 
Go back up one more, Greg. It just went down more. You're asking way too much. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> They're right there. All right, so this kind of shows, in clause networks, there's three stage, there's five stage um, uh, architectures, and you have northward stages, and you've got southbound stages that have a rich amount of equal cost multipaths. I've already mentioned some of these problems for steering, steering airflow flows and path divisions to different um, uh, SIs. Okay, next. Four, yeah. Yeah, that's hard, I know. I'm not, we're not gonna use the. Every time I touch it, it's something different. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay. Um, and so, again, by using the beer entropy, you can be able to provide more deterministic um, path selection. Um, and you can use, like I mentioned in stage one, for instance, use bit zero of that 20 bit entropy um, label to represent red and blue plaths. And um, you can, on different stages, in this case, stage two, use different bits of that entropy uh, label to represent three paths to each of the different uh, clusters um, to be able to provide a deterministic equal cost multipath along um, a data center multi-stage network. Next slide. Good. Uh, yeah. Chef from Cisco. Um, so in, in this, uh, you're, you're showing how d d how to potentially break up the entropy field to, to set deterministic paths. Mm -hmm. the, cons the, the question I have is around uh, where the beer header gets written in a way to use these paths. So um, that would have to be, I, I guess, below stage one? Or it could happen either way. I mean, if you had IP multicast at the pod level and beer in the DC, it's the first imposition point creates that field, right? Yeah, that's that's correct. So in in my view, it would be in stage one. It's a local decision that's being made. And so um, stage one being the, the pod. So you're doing imposition at the host level or you're talking about. At I the, guess it could be at the I wasn't thinking of host level. I was thinking in the pod, but I okay. suppose so it's IP it multicast from the from the host into the pod. That's right. Now the pod is aware of the topology decisions. So um, just without taking away your, your thunder here and going yeah, forward, yeah. Uh, this could be a DC specific decision on how the bits are used, right? Could be just network or like beer domain decision. Not necessarily we have to have a architecture doc that specifies the bits to be used in this way, but here is a particular way to use those bits and how you cut them up based on how many ECMP paths, the, the complexity of your topology you can set a beer wide specific configuration. You sure could. Okay. Using controller or whatever to yeah. make that happen. Okay. That's right. Exactly right. Okay. So next slide. Just uh, mic, please. Yes. Okay. We're all, we're just about done. We're done. So go to slide six. It just kind of specifies some of the forwarding procedure um, using beer entropy to, to select the path over equal cause paths. Um, I already explained that this draft defines a method, use part of that 20-bit entry label, and um, it should be easier and should be more granular and more deterministic than using just the typical hashing ECMP function. So um, with that, um, I was just going to leave it at that and just kind of go on, but I think um, it would be good to have a discussion about if this is something that this type of whether it's just draft or not, this type of topic is that this is something that we think that we should address, work on here in MBOND. Question? Yeah, tell us. Um, so I think, uh, you know, the most simple but, you know, problematic reference example to show, you know, to have people believe in the problem, right? So I think starting with what, uh, you know, uh, Greg was saying, maybe, you know, the smallest kind of data center, right, which could be production truck with a bunch of, you know, small stuff and then video, whatever it is, right, so that, that set the expectation in terms of, yeah, this is a problem, and then the other things are fine. I mean, I, I completely forgot the details. So do we have polarization in the beer ECMP? That's one of the typical issues to deal with, right? I don't remember it in the algorithm. Obviously, you know, I also stand out on you know, behalf of this author of BRTE and say that we haven't thought about really that much about the ECMP stuff. It was obviously mostly about non-ECMP path, but we could also think about comparing this, what we can achieve with the beer ECMP with the explicit hop by hop engineering of the path and the data center with BRTE. Oh, right? BRTE, so, okay, specifically, yeah. right. Yeah, right, so I mean, I, I think there are options. I, I would start with the, you know, do you buy into the problem statement with, 
you know, the best possible reference example we can come up with. Because, you know, if you buy into the problem statement, what, what else can we do than work on it, right? So, yeah, okay. Thank you. Any comments about, well, maybe this is a chair discussion, but this being worked on in beer or in MOD. So. Gotcha. So the question is, is this, uh, so who's read the draft? Uh, who feels this is material that should be adopted as a working group item? In this working group? Well, or any working group. Yeah, that's a good That's a good question. Uh, Jeffrey, I'll hear your input. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Jeffrey from Juniper. Uh, if this involves uh, defined methods of using the part of the uh, entropy uh, uh, field in beer or the beer la entropy label, what is it? Can you first clarify if uh, this you, uh, you, you on this slide you mean you, you mentioned that uh, use part of the twenty bit entropy label? Are you talking about entropy label? Or are you talking about entropy field in the beer header? Do you want to answer that, Jingran? Uh, uh, entropy field in the beer header, of course. Uh, but generally speaking, in entropy. Uh, it's uh, followed with uh, a label. It's a uh, uh, twenty bit value, just a twenty bit value. Okay. So if this involves beer entropy field and uh, also involves some specific uh, beer forwarding behavior, then I think it sh should be part of the beer working group. Um, another comment is that if you want to control how the, uh, the, the, the path that the packet follows, another way to do this is uh, use uh, multi-topologies or, or just a flexible algo uh, so that uh, you can de uh, de decide that some packets follows uh, one sub-topology, sub sub some other packets follows a different sub-topology. That's another way to do it. Right. Can I, I'm going to address that one in particular because I think um, the use case that I'm thinking of that kind of came up from reading the document is specific enough that the multi-topology, it would be very complicated. You would have to have several of them, not just a couple. Uh, and we're not really trying to select topology necessarily. We're trying to ensure that each of the hops don't have collisions. So you could build complete matrix of topologies to ensure that's the case. But in a flow by flow basis, you may want to make a different determination that this link was okay now, but now at the next hop down, we've got a congestion issue. I want this to keep on this hop, but take the next one over here to avoid that congestion. So it's, that's what I mean by this matrix of topologies could get very complicated quickly. So I, I think to Torlis's point, maybe a more specific problem statement would allow to burrow into a solution that is very specific to that problem. Uh, Stig, um, I agree that this should be done in beer, I think, because it does yeah, seem to alter the beer forwarding yeah. in some way, right? So you're presenting us tomorrow on beer? Yeah. For more than just courtesy now. More oh, than that, it sounds something like better. that. So, yeah. right. You can wear something better for that? No. So, so, so Tarlis, it wasn't kind of clear to me, you know, if you're really changing something in beer or just basically, you know, what a, an application using beer and setting the field would be doing. So might be borderline whether it should be beer or mbondi, but overall the problem statement, you know, describing the example reference problems. So anything operational would be good here. So, I mean, I have no strong opinions either way, right? So, uh, I don't remember now, does the beer specification say how to set the entropy, exactly how it should be calculated, or is it left more or less open? I think it says it's out of scope in that in the document, but we should double check that. Okay. But yeah, if, if, if it doesn't you know, require changes in beer forwarding, if it's more how you set that value, yeah, then it's not that clear where it should go. Yeah. My, my so specifying how the value is set versus specifying, well, it's kind of both, really. But instead of the entropy field pointing to an ECMP table, it points to some deterministic table that's effectively ECMP, but it's not built on hash, it's built on some predefined topology. <coughs> okay, 
I think so yeah, we're running out of time, but um, did we need, so I, you're just gonna present, so why don't you present yeah, let's it go from there and at then Beer we, and then see, uh, the good news is we have a common co-chair yeah. for both, so Greg, um, you know, you can kind of we can, lead the charge in determining yeah, we'll where this out. belongs. Thank you. All right, next up, um, Jake, I hope you don't mind. We're gonna we're gonna move Natalie up ahead of you, um, and she's gonna present on uh, her experience in AMT Gateway Implementation Building in VLC. Um, so, Natalie, are you there? Yes. Can you hear me all right? Yep. Um, so, just uh, in in London, we had uh, William Zhang um, present. Uh, his experience in deploying an AMT relay. Um, one of his uh, pieces of feedback was that, okay, the relay's up and running. Uh, there is content out there. However, the state of gateway implementations is uh, not so awesome. Um, you know, the best, uh, most widely usable uh, implementation was a VLC Windows port that was about 10 to 12 years old. Um, so Natalie has been working on uh, examining um, uh, the the the, uh, the best strategy for uh, deploying gateways, um, and she's going to talk about her experience, what led her to VLC, and what um, uh, how things have been going. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so yeah, Lenny explained the background for that a lot. So. Um, I am, you can probably just go to the next slide then. Uh, so the end goal of the project was to allow end users to access multicast content over the internet because it's out there, but there's not an easy way to get it. Um, you kind of have to do a lot of workarounds. And uh, so I made a list of various ways that we could do this so that in the end it would be easy for even like my mom to use who she kind of struggles with technology. Um, cause I don't want it to be, she has to enter an IP address and like go through all the stuff. Cause she, you know, something goes wrong with her email and she's like, I'm done. I quit. So, um, I've been doing that since, uh, the end of May. That's been my project at Juniper and I had no idea what AMT was before this. Um, so it's definitely been an experience. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, so again, I made a list of a bunch of possible platforms. Our original goal was to use um, a web browser implementation because that tends to be the easiest for people. I mean, you just you go to a website, you like click and it's there. That's really easy for most people to understand and use, but I did find some issues with that. So um, with WebRTC, uh, at least from what I found, it had no multicast support um, and then WebAssembly had no UDP support because AMT works over UDP. Without that, it just doesn't work. Um, so then I looked into making a plugin for a browser like Chrome, Firefox, and then you know making it available to all of them. But I found out that Google apparently uh, deprecated plugins starting in like 2016. They have the, had this like movement, and then it kind of like finalized in 2018, where uh, plugins you can no longer create new ones, even though uh, older ones can still be maintained. So I didn't want to start on making a plugin just to have it be, you know, completely out of date soon after and other issues arise with that. Um, and then I tried an extension and uh, the gist of it was that anything to do with the web browser seemed there's no raw UDP access. So, um, oh, I'm sorry, was there garbled speech? Nope. Oh, okay. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know why it's echoey. Uh, We're not hearing an echo if, if that helps. Okay. Um, but with the browser implementation, there used to be uh, an API for accessing UDP sockets, but um, it has been put out of date or like when I even just started on some of the tutorials for like writing a plugin or something like that, I kept getting all these errors about like, hey, this is deprecated, you shouldn't use it, like try moving to something else, but it's newer. So um, there's there's not a an API and, and it's understandable from a security standpoint, just 
accessing raw UDP sockets, but uh, they're also, um, Google is pushing progressive web apps, which then it seems like Mozilla was following suit from the, um, the stuff that I read. And there's, again, still no UDP support. So I settled on VLC integration because uh, VLC is essentially the most widely used media player that isn't the default because it, you, there, um, a lot of people when they have issues with their media player, if they go to Google and search for something, VLC is like the next thing there. Um, and it also, it already has native multicast support uh, and it's available on like all platforms. Like they, they have a port for basically everything um, and it's backwards compatible for like all their old versions and stuff like that. So, uh, and theoretically, I actually found this out more recently. They also have a plugin like that has already been made. So theoretically, if the AMT module got added in, um, then you could make a web uh, application that could use that plugin that um, as long as everything gets pushed upstream and such. So uh, you can go to the next slide. Still there, Next Natalie? Slide. Oh, can you not hear me? You kind of trailed off there the last 10 seconds. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, what was the last thing I said? Um, <laughs> we didn't hear it. Um, uh, sorry. We're, uh, you can probably, you ready to go to the next slide? Uh, yeah. Okay. Hopefully this um, works out better. I. I think I'm it's using better. the default mic, like, but I'm totally not sure better. what, is it better? Yes, yeah, now it's good. Okay, cool. Um, so the other benefits of VLC, it handles basically all major media types. Um, it can play almost anything, even like corrupt files, which is really good. Uh, it's also modular, so adding parts into it and like developing on its source, card, source code is pretty easy because you don't have to worry about breaking it, uh, the other functionality too much. And again, it runs on almost any platform. I found that, that it's pretty easy to use from my standpoint. But then again, I'm also you know, a computer science person. Um, it could possibly be easier for, to use for people who don't, but it's still got a lot of uh, instructions out there um, in terms of how to use it. So uh, you can go on to the next slide. Um, so what I did is I started on an access module. They, VLC has all these kinds of modules that work for different things like output, um, access, uh, demuxing. So most of the demuxers are actually the what decodes the streams and stuff like that. Um, so my idea was that I'll create an access module that essentially you know opens the ports, sends the correct uh, messages, the discovery advertisement and such, and then pass that data onto a demuxer because um, theoretically VLC can already read whatever the data is because it should be a major media type. It shouldn't be something ridiculously obscure. Um, I did start off using the UT Dallas uh, AMT implementation. Um, I kind of looked at that first only because it was you know, already integrated with VLC, quote unquote, but it was also from a much earlier version of VLC that wasn't quite as modular then. So. Um, it's helpful-ish. It was also mostly, uh, it had a lot of Windows API specific stuff. So um, it wouldn't work as well for uh, compiling with VLC. Jay Collin, both his code and just talking to him over email was really helpful um, for me to understand and also just where to get started because VLC is just really big even though there is a lot of documentation and stuff. Um, kind of confusing to get started. Uh, Cisco has an open source um, library for uh, SSM AMT. Uh, so that was also pretty useful. Um, theirs was also though intended to, you can like set up a relay and a gateway from that. And some of it wasn't fully functional. So I mostly borrowed from it uh, what I needed. Um, and then the Concordia uh, implementation I referenced and looked at and was using in my initial research to kind of get familiarized myself with um, everything going on. So uh, next slide. Um, so some of the major challenges, uh, I spent a couple weeks um, partially doing research to actually understand AMT, but also just the appropriate path, because again, I would keep 
trying something with a web browser and then find out, oh, it doesn't have this kind of support. Oh, it doesn't do this. So um, that was a little difficult. Uh, I actually did have to duplicate a little bit of the IGMP and IP protocols um, in order for AMT to work and just getting my messages to send correctly. Um, AMT wasn't a, understanding it itself wasn't a huge challenge, but it was still there as something I had to overcome in the beginning. Uh, right now, also, my where I'm stuck right now is that I can receive the multicast data because uh, I send the messages correctly and like Wireshark shows me receiving the multicast data, but the audio is garbled and there's no video rendering. So, um, and I've tried syncing it up with uh, the Windows VM I have for the other, um, the working implementation and the audio lines up, it's just dropping like packets randomly and um, the output from VLC is like skipping 30 bytes of garbage. So I'm just stuck right there because it seems like I'm not unpacking the packet correctly. Uh, VLC seems to be confused by some of the headers. Um, I will say it was much easier than expected for me to compile VLC and actually start on writing the module because I haven't actually contributed to open source before. Um, I'm still in college, so it just, I haven't done it yet. Um, so that was much easier than I expected. Uh, so um, next slide. So I still have a to-do list for um, the rest of the summer. Uh, I have some weeks, a couple weeks left. I do want to add in IGM v2 support because I've been focusing on IGM v3. I don't think it should be a huge um, leap from what I'm doing now. Uh, I need to make sure I have no memory leaks because um, VLC, most of their modules are written in C. So I just need to make sure there's no memory leaks. Uh, I don't currently have the timers fully working just because of the way I'm receiving data right now. And I was mostly mostly focusing on the actual functionality rather than timers just yet. Um, I mentioned it before, VLC looks like it does have a browser plugin. So I could uh, once provided this uh, module would be like accepted into their access. Uh, you can make a browser plugin that's then easy where you know someone clicks on a website and it's like, I wanna watch this multicast stream. And when it doesn't work natively, it just does AMT through VLC. Um, the end goal is of course to successfully stream full video and audio because of, there's um, a relay already set up at uh, Thomas Jefferson High School near here. so. Um, and then later on, submit a patch request, feature request to VLC so that this module will be in their full thing. Um, yeah, so um, next slide. I don't know. Oh, impressions. So with AMT, um, again, I didn't actually know what AMT was before I started on this project. Uh, at first, I was like a little confused because it didn't fully make sense to me. But um, then like once I like read the RFC and uh, into it more or some of the articles that Lenny sent me, uh, I definitely think it's really good for solving, as he called it, like the chicken and egg problem where it's like, there's not that much multicast content or, um, but there's also like not an audience because there's no content, but there's no content because there's no audience. So I think it's a really useful way to help transition into, hey, let's have more multicast content available for as many people as possible. Um, I did think the RFC 7450 was pretty well written, um, very thorough, uh, the diagrams were great. Um, so VLC itself, uh, just briefly, their documentation is better than some of the other open source um, projects that I've looked into before or had to like glance at for school and their chat and forums were okay. Um, just from my experience, I had some issues that everyone kind of dismissed right away. And I was like, okay. But I, it was really easy to start developing though based on their guides for it. So um, I think that's it for impressions. So last slide, I think. So um, yeah, any questions or comments? <coughs> Cool. Well, uh, thank you, um, Natalie. You're you're a um, kind of an an, an excellent uh, um, 
a, a good case study for this working group um, because AMT, the spec was essentially written for someone like you, uh, somebody who doesn't necessarily know multicast but can walk in. And, and so it is good to hear that uh, you were able to pick up the spec and uh, figure out how to start writing an implementation. So that's actually great feedback for, for this working group. Uh, Greg Shepard from uh, Cisco. So what are your next steps? Um, right now, I'm still trying to finish up and actually get the video stream in addition to the audio because um, it's not fully synced up right now. Like I'm definitely receiving the data. I just don't think I'm processing the packets correctly. So it's kind of a matter of like checking my sockets and checking that VLC is actually uh, getting the data correct since again, it kind of jumps through a lot of hoops. So the most immediate one is fixing that. But then after that, it's um, going through the steps to do like a feature request and like code documentation and all that. Excellent, thank you. Yep. Great. <clears throat> Thanks, Natalie. Yeah. Okay, Jake, you are up. Hit the big red button for him. Is he gonna do it that way? Or? Uh, well, we didn't need to hit it for Natalie, so I'm assuming it just worked for Jake. Oh, once we hit the button, it's been hit. Yes. Okay, it's so one hit it once. Gotcha. Here's that good Oh, maybe not. Am I up there now? There you, there you go. Hey, we got video too. I held my comments because I knew I was going, but thank you, Natalie. That's exciting work. That's uh, uh, I'm interested in, in uh, hearing more about your progress, seeing that end up working. Uh, great. So um, I'm going to talk about our new proposal for um, asymmetric manifest based integrity. This is uh, meant to provide integrity guarantees. Uh, cryptographic integrity guarantees for um, for multicast data streams in particular. Uh, you could, I think there's no reason you can't use it for unicast, um, but uh, it, particularly maybe like you know, AMT uh, would be a potentially useful case to do that. But mostly we're looking for multicast. Um, yeah, interdomain multicast. We think that one of the issues. It, it maybe is not the only issue, but I think it's a blocking issue that um, we're not going to have a real M bone with interdomain multicast that, you know, is friendly and widely available uh, if we can't make good integrity guarantee, ultimately, I think. And so this, to me, we're trying to fill a, a hole, uh, we think, in the uh, what we've got. So uh, you guys know why multicast, but uh, we're trying to solve the interdomain multicast problem. Um, and uh, that's one of the points of feedback I want. If I'm wrong about that, then I would like to understand it and, and know that. Um, but, uh, but that's the sort of premise behind this. Uh, yeah, next slide. Um, Jake, uh, I think, or at least the, the other folks on the, on the Meet Echo, I, we see you. I don't know if they see the slides. Do the Meet Echo people see the slides? All right. So, um, so our goals here are about uh, we want to have mostly what we're trying to solve is uh, is live video. That's kind of the main uh, use case we want. Um, and we're looking for asymmetric crypto. So we mostly want integrity because when we're talking about live video, especially to a wide audience, uh, you know, symmetric key is just not, like there's no point, right? Um, and we basically want to be able to do it at, at, and handle loss appropriately. So next slide. Um, okay, there we go. Um, so, let me preface this, uh, the next three slides, including this. Um, we got some great feedback yesterday from Sec Dispatch. Uh, Ecker pointed us, pointed us at um, a really interesting paper that I think might be able to improve this or help us uh, improve on, on the scheme that we have. But um, what I'll describe here is the scheme that we've got in the 
the draft now. Um, and uh, just take note that we might be able to do a little better. So the basic idea is that there is an anchor message uh, up on the top left. That is the um, uh, that that's fetched purely usually by Unicast uh, uh, a secure Unicast connection, um, but we say any secure uh, transfer is fine, um, where we can verify the authenticity, uh, and that contains public keys. The public keys can be used to verify a signature that's part of a manifest. The manifest, in addition to a signature where appropriate, has hashes of the data packets that it's authenticated. So this provides proof that, um, cryptographic proof that the sender, that the uh, owner of the private key listed in a securely transferred anchor knows the, uh, knows the data packets that were part of this data stream. Okay, so next next slide. <clears throat> yeah, uh, so the we extended this because we noticed that um, it's going to have scaling problems. So when you're talking about like a 20 megabit flow, you're looking at um, like 2,000 data packets a second, uh, depending on what kind of security you think you can get away with in your hash lengths, you're looking at uh, like 100, 40 to 100 hashes per uh, packet at most if, with, a, with a zero length signature. And we're not sure how, how big the signature has to be necessarily. If you want to use RSA, if you want a, you know, a big RSA, then, then you're going to take a chunk out of that as well. Um, so, uh, by making a tree, we can, so this is kind of like a Merkle tree uh, structure here. By making a tree, we can have a signature at the root of the tree, which then uh, provides integrity for child manifests that don't have to themselves hold a signature. And the child manifests then have the hashes of the, of the data packets. So this still provides the um, very similar kind of uh, integrity guarantees for the data packets themselves through this chain of uh, manifests. Um, next slide. <laughs> so for redundancy, of course, we need, uh, you can either retransmit the, the manifests that you want, or you can send the data packet hashes multiple different times signed by a different tree in the different times that it's signed. So this is a trade-off of, uh, of signature rate versus, um, you know, redundancy uh, versus uh, latency of the video stream you're trying to secure, right? So the and, and so this is uh, these are all configurable as part of the anchor message to decide to determine like what is it that you're going to be sending, um, and uh, and send it in a manner that that matches this. And uh, as long as you're getting the assigned hashes of the data packets, you can verify that all the data packets you're receiving are the ones you expect or reject the ones that. Okay, so next slide. <laughs> so, um, one important piece that's uh, all these things that I've said so far, you can sort of get by Tesla already. Um, Tesla is a, a spec from a while back. Um, which provides the way they do it is uh, is a symmetric key, but they don't release the key until after everybody has received the data packets, and then they they send the key out, and then you can tell that ah yes, the key, the data packets that we have are the ones that were signed by the key that just got disclosed under a signature. So um, one of the new capabilities that Abby provides is that uh, intermediate nodes can provide uh, authentication as well. So you can avoid sending unauthenticated traffic into a network if you put it at your engines. At least that's the intent and the hope. Um, one of the points we noticed was that um, an attacker in a setup like this, where they've got a way to send untrusted traffic as a uh, man on the side, so you're adjacent to the path, not necessarily on the path. But you can spoof the traffic here, and uh, you can when you have receivers joined to a to a stream that you're attacking, you can 
make a congestion attack, um, which at the IXP layer might not be a significant amount of traffic, but might still overrun the uh, what the receivers can handle. Uh, next slide. So the way we do that is that the uh, intermediate AMBI system has to get the anchor and be able to process these uh, these packets uh, and authenticate them before forwarding. So the idea is, this is a, an idea we stole from uh, from the uh, um, AMT relay discovery uh, from a couple of years back that's still languishing. Um, might be worth looking at again. But uh, the, the idea is that an SG join is issued. And because we have the source as part of the SG, as the RPF uh, signal goes back to the to the AMBI node, that's an intermediate uh, an intermediate system. Um, it now can do a uh, a DNS lookup on the reverse I, the reverse source IP, and uh, we are. Um, I think it's not in the draft yet, but the uh, the plan is to make a DNS type here and to uh, use that to expose the, the URL for the anchor uh, message. And then the anchor message provides all the information necessary to authenticate all the source, all the, source, uh, all the traffic from this source um, that, that is being authenticated through Abby. Uh, so next slide. Uh, so next steps, we of course are looking to improve the protocol. We have the uh, uh, you know our, our research to uh, look on how to um, pick, how to integrate the the advice we got from Sec Dispatch so far. The other advice from Sec Dispatch was um, if we want to talk about opening MSEC, then we need to go find people who are interested in this. So I was really hoping that this audience would be um, universally interested um, or or close to. Uh, and um, uh, I understand some people may not think that uh, interdomain multicast is one solved, but um, in my opinion, that is the essence of Um And so I'm, I'm hoping that we can uh, uh, look for ways to move this forward. Um, any feedback, of course, is very welcome. Uh, next slide. I think it's just more asking for feedback. And uh, yeah. Um, right, the DNS thing, I haven't seen it a lot. Um, I'm interested in hearing if people do have problems with that idea. Uh, the sooner we can understand them, the better. Um, obviously, if this whole idea is is just not worthwhile, um, I would like to understand that as well uh, and walk away before I spend too much time on it. Um, and outside that, yeah, we'd like to make it just as, as solid as we can. Uh, we're you know, depending on the feedback we get, we uh, are probably looking at taking a stab at, at an implementation sometime. You know, maybe maybe we'll have some forward motion before uh, before the, you know, November. Hopefully. So, Jake, so Jake uh, Greg from Cisco, got a question for you. Uh, so, you mentioned MSEC. So, is there again a bit of a gap analysis to see what MSEC, what ball do they drop that you're trying to pick up here? Right, so um, I addressed that a little bit in the draft. It's the, under the heading of, um, of uh, comparison with Tesla. The basic problem is that Tesla doesn't provide non-repudiation. You can't, and so the issue is that if we want to, uh, if we want to let both the receiver perform authentication and a network element perform authentication, then Tesla can't do it because by the time by the time you release the key, either the uh, the intermediate network node has forwarded untrusted traffic, or the receiver um, is not going to get a key. Is not going to have the data before they get the key. Got Does that it. Makes sense. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Comments. Uh, on the last one, the feedback on the DNS thing, um, I, I think uh, relay discovery, AMT relay discovery is a long overdue topic. 
uh, like you said, there was the AT&T guys came up with a, a draft uh, using DNS. Actually, maybe 15 years ago, uh, someone um, uh, from Sprint came up with uh, a similar way of using DNS. Um, and uh, I think it's worth reopening, not just DNS, but just generally speaking, how do you pick a relay when there's a bunch of them, some of them being Anycast? And do you pick the one closest to you? Do you pick the one closest to the source? Do you pick the most? Um, uh, so I, I think that's, that's, that's uh, definitely something worth looking at. And I think DNS uh, can, can play a role in that. So, um, Right. So that's another point. If there is feedback on the DNS thing, um, there are at least one, that being the AMT relay, and possibly two, uh, possibly another thing that I want to consider using it for, because I, I think the trick is pretty good for finding a, uh, you know, RPF source related thing from an intermediate node. So, um, yeah, if you don't like that idea, then I would like to know why. Um, all right. <laughs> Well, thank you for the slot. Appreciate Great. Thanks, Jake. Okay. All right. Torless, come on down. Um, so you have two presentations. You have 25 minutes. Scheduled for 25 minutes, ironically. Nope. We are right on track. So you, you, you have, have 10 minutes, Torlis. Tell him 25. He'll take six. Actually, honestly, you have the 30 minutes after that until Pim starts. So you, you, you have until people leave. Yeah. Um, you have the cookie hour. But uh, my, my suggestion is do the deprecate one first yeah. uh, and then do the other. But uh, yeah. Uh, let's try that. You can try. It doesn't work, but you can try. Okay. If we try it and play a presentation, I'll try that. Okay. You're, you're trying it. No. Next slide. You can scroll over here. That's all he gets. All right. You need us. I'm so lost without you. Okay. So, uh, anybody still remembers uh, ITF 101? Um, so, we discussed basically at that point in time the um, kind of revised new draft um, that came out of uh, prior drafts in which we, you know, started trying to deprecate ASM completely. And so we wound that down to deprecating ASM in the interdomain space, not but not in the intradomain space. Um, so that was the agreement, hopefully, basically with uh, 101, um, the zero zero draft of that eliminating the resistance that we had in terms of trying to get uh, all the way into deprecating ASM all the way. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, one of the reasons, of course, is that ASM intradomain is still widely used, right? So there is really no replacement for the best form of ASM, BIDER PIM, in enterprises, you know, to replace, you know, 20,000 ESCOMA G state with a few group states. Um, and we can still think about, you know, starting to retire more intradomain, I think, operationally. But, you know, really the primary issue from the operational perspective is that it's a really good thing to start deprecating on the service provider side because that's where uh, basically the service providers have a good impact on getting the applications to move to SSM, right? They run their IPTV shop. They basically uh, are in much better position to get the SSM adopted. While in the enterprises, we've seen that for 20 years, it's really very hard um, for them to force applications to support SSM. Um, if we're lucky, basically, the stuff that happens on the service provider side, SSM-wise, will trickle in the um, enterprises as well. I mean, these days, what new applications exist, they're all the ones that are being used in the internet now. The enterprise isn't really the place where innovation happens. So that's why I think we're going the right order of, you know, not touching uh, the um, enterprise's interdomain right now. Um, but, you know, even something like Internet 2, if you uh, remember the discussion we had in before as being one of those networks that's trying to get rid of ASM, um, that's connecting a lot of enterprises, research organizations, right? So that would, uh, you know, already start going that direction. Um, so that is uh, 0 um, uh, Yeah, next slide, I think. Yeah. Right, so then basically shortly before 101, too late to, to bring it up in 101, I provided, uh, you know, a bunch of 
uh, clarifications and additional operational insight. Um, <clears throat> and so that became version 01. I got onto the authors list there. Um, <clears throat> Uh, with, you know, explanations like the one I had on the previous slide, um, adding text to discuss the MSDP challenges and why there is no MSDP for IPv6, so kind of a bunch of the background um, providing further evidence of, you know, how really dead ASM in real interdomain actually already is. And so, you know, maybe we can still rephrase that. We're really not killing it, right? It's basically already dead. MSDP is really used in very few interdomain deployments uh, already only. Um, so, um, yeah, so please read through the 101. Um, was there anything? No. So I think the, the key part of that was uh, the bottom point, right? Expanding the scope of um, interdomain. So one of the tricks was what is it actually intra and interdomain? And you can have different views on it, right? One is from the protocol side. So a PIM person will tell you, oh, interdomain, you need to have different PIM domains. But if you come from an operational perspective, it's good enough to say you have multiple administrative entities that are managing around in the network. And that definition, if we take it operationally, really allows me to say a single service provider that has you know a million home networks with home gateways together is an interdomain case. And et voila, I've also um, made uh, what we're saying, interdomain be applicable to the most simple case where we really want um, ASM out of the picture, and that is a service provider offering IPTV services that goes to a million homes, and where you definitely don't want to muck around with PIM sparse mode. Service provider tried it. It took them, in many cases, six years to get the bloody IPTV application vendors uh, to support SSM. In many cases, they had to change their vendors um, uh, to others, but now we're really in round two or round three of these IPTV deployments, and I would hope they are pretty much SSM everywhere. Next slide. Um, continue. Right, so and there is a, a, a lot more um, additional stuff. So we added text to also suggest to prefer SSM intradomain when possible, right? Um, and uh, discuss the application dependencies when and where that's not possible. Um, added stuff to suggest documenting in some BCP uh, for how to develop SSM application to really support this move, right? Because um, I think there are things that we learned, like uh, you know how to get SSM in elect into electronic program guides for IPTV applications or whatever signaling you have, wherever you are signaling a group address. Why don't you signal a source address uh, together with it, right? So that would be you know added work we're suggesting to be done here. Um, yeah, and then O2 was just uh, fixes, right? Um, nope. Stop. This slide. So. And this is basically the stuff that I primarily wanted to talk about um, in, um, in the PIM working group. Um, so the associated candidate work would really be figuring out how can we get the uh, classification of our standards into shape because right now, um, older standards that nobody should use have a better standard level than what we want them to use, like IGMP B2. Um, so that uh, is in a different, uh, di different presentation. Um, and then also, how can we get completely rid of MSDP, right? Uh, deprecating ASM uh, interdomain uh, almost gets the job done. Unfortunately, MSDP is already more or less retired, as I said, interdomain, but it's heavily used intradomain. Um, uh, for the MSDP mesh group. And it's actually doing a pretty decent job for that, right? But if we want to kill it, I think we need to basically make the protocol that we actually would want to use for uh, mesh groups, which is RFC 4610, um, ramp up with all the operational requirements that we have, and that's reliability, debuggability, troubleshooting, and control. Um, what we've learned in MSDP over the years, so the proposal is there. Um, one draft uh, that that we have in PIM to basically get us to the you know transport over TCP for the reliability flow control between the RPs, and the other one would be a Yang model that somebody still needs to write or hopefully find a Yang uh, author where we can add it to one of the existing Yang drafts or updating them. Um, the SSM application development recommendations that I mentioned before, I'm not sure what other, you know, uh, outcome we want to have on really evolving the standards basis operationally and protocol wise of, you know, our, you know, core framework, but these seem to me to be the most important pieces that we uh, could think about. Next slide. So conclusions. So the authors think the document is uh, really in good shape, right? All the strategic concerns for adoption should have been eliminated, right? Um, and so, oh, 
Yeah, that's, so, so just I, I actually just overlooked that. So that's uh, yeah. I was just clueless about the process. So reminders to the list, uh, maybe maybe good. That's great. So yeah, so um, in London we did a in, uh, in the meeting, and uh, I think it was every you know everybody's hands were raised in favor. We took it to the list uh, last week, I believe. Um, we still haven't heard from. There hasn't been much replies on the list, so we can't adopt this until folks speak up on the list. Um, so what I would say is, uh, so first off, let, let's just retake a poll and make sure nobody's mind has been changed in the last four months. Um, uh, who who here uh, who here has read the draft? Anyone? Okay. Uh, who supports uh, adoption of this draft? Just to clarify, <clears throat> can you remind me what deprecation means? Like, what's the effect of that in the ITF? Webster's question, yes. Dictionary so. defines deprecate <laughs> as. Yeah. We, I mean, at minimum, I hope it, it just represents, a, you know, a statement from the working group. But yeah, I mean, what official, you know, levers can we pull? Yeah, so we don't have a police force. Um, the best we can do is write drafts and BCPs that say, if you're going to do interdomain multicast, don't do ASM, do SSM. Uh, so it is direction to the world uh, that when you deploy multicast. So what does that really mean? Because again, we don't have a police force to, you know, jackbooted thugs that we can send out to Knox everywhere to start um, turning off MSDP and uh, other things. Um, uh, or filtering, we're telling people to filter, you know, everything that's not sla uh, 232 slash eight. Um, what effectively it means is it can help, you know, the, the M bone, which we are M bone D, uh, the M bone does exist. It is the multicast enabled portion of the internet and it is primarily I2. So I2 is probably 90% of the M bone. Uh, and they continue to maintain an MSDP infrastructure. They continue to support mm -hmm. uh, interdomain multicast. And so it would give them the ability to, uh, and this was one of the drivers, to turn this off and explain to their members, this is why we're turning this off. You know, the 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 uh, it is it is best practices to not do interdomain multicast uh, ASM to do SSM for interdomain. So maybe maybe two comments on that, right? So I think the um, this target status of the uh, draft that we're asking for is BCP, and then I think the way that you pitch this to customers is a BCP is like a standard, not for product calls, but for operators, <laughs> right? So, I mean, that's, I think, the, the, yeah. the simple pitch or so, and it's hard to somebody to challenge it because I think that's pretty true, right? The second one, can you send an email about this, you know, filtering of 232? I don't think we had that uh, um, recommendation part in it, so it's a good one. that we No, no, I, I, we're not recommending it. Oh, you don't recommend it? Yeah, okay. if you remember, uh, uh, in, in London, okay. that was one of the things that okay. was suggested and it was mixed. Okay, fine, um, cool. So yeah, I, I don't I don't think we want to go that far. It's more of a finger wag than a um, mm -hmm. uh, a jackbooted thug coming to your network to turn it off. Okay. But um, uh, another benefit, uh, Mike, is to give clear direction to application providers, out, people outside of this working group who just think that oh we'll just you know join a group uh, that you you need to do SSM. Uh, that that here is you know a BCP BCPs are saying you know there's an RFC that officially says don't do ASM do SSM so right. it helps providers it helps operators give clear direction to their yeah. uh, app app developers right. yeah and so all the folks who raised the hand please don't sleep on the email list for the next few months say yes yeah. when the yeah, well, no, don't. It's not for the next few months. If you want to send an email right now, yeah. you can. Uh, so, so you know, when we took that informal poll, it was you know five. Oh, it, so that was uh, I believe five people raised their hand to support it. Anybody uh, against supporting this uh, this draft? Who doesn't want to see this draft adopted? Okay, so it's five zero. Um, please, folks send an email to the mailing list that says I support or I do not support, but we need to hear, we can't adopt this unless we get, uh, again, unless we get enough replies. The, the problem is just the other half of the working group is co-authors, so that kind <laughs> yeah. of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, next Any slide Any other please. questions oh, about, okay. uh, for Deprecate ASM? 
All right, moving on. Right, so this is uh, just for informational purposes. Um, um, well, we have the time, so we, 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 we can talk uh, about it. Sure. You have somewhere between 11 and 61 minutes, <laughs> <laughs> depending on how much time right. you want to take. Yeah, no, that's fine. So let's uh, go through it. Uh, next slide. Okay, so problem statement. Um, so if you are trying to adopt a protocol from a host to a network to signal multicast, what would be the highest, um, you know, internet standard level of any protocol? This is a is, this is a Q and A session here. So, this is so I mean, you're trying to be engaging, right? I'm trying to be engaging. So, <laughs> yeah, this is a test. You are the answer. Internet standard. Yes. Okay. Because so full. Uh, no, no. In reading the slide, it's, it's cheating. So, <laughs> right. So basically, favorite? I'm trying to uh, you know adopt the best available uh, protocol standard. I'm most conservative, so I'm go looking for a full Ethernet standard. That means I can't use IPv6. They only have you know proposed standards. I need to use IPv4. And the protocol I want is IGMT version one, which is full Internet standard in RFC one 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 two. That is exactly what we want to be, right? No, I don't think so. Right, so that's that's I think the best pitch I can give about the problem statement here. So, so in so v, v2, IGMP v2 and IGMP v3 never made it to no. internet standard. No, proposed standard. Wow, do you know why? I have no idea. Probably because we've all been been asleep at the wheel and never cared about processes. Have you been at that RFCI on Monday evening? Kind of process is really not a nice thing to think about. But you know, after a decade, maybe you know, just investing a little bit in this process um, to basically make sure at least that stuff isn't becoming a reason why people do the wrong thing. Uh, I think this is just like a natural process, or kind of like how ITF works and. You know, IGMP version 1 has been there for a long time. It became kind of mature and right. sure, we make it as standard. But of course, in the, the later versions, they have been around for a shorter time. So it's just takes time. Whatever. Just in 20 years instead of 30. Yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah. I, but, that's... But, but I would like to, yeah, maybe see in the ITF in general, you know, what happens when you come up with newer versions like new protocols? Right. How do you deprecate? Uh, I think maybe making it historic. Is yeah, this is the problem, right? So there's basically this poor uh, PIM working group chair or area director that I'm going to ask these questions yeah. in, in some session in <laughs> yes. an hour or so, right? Yeah, so at least my thought would be version one should probably become historic or deprecated, yeah. but yeah. we'll talk to ADs and others to find right. out. And, and of course, we need to look at probably, you know, either version two or version three, if you want to make something a standard, you generally need to go through like implementation report, make sure what all the Well, are you going to say something different now as an individual Mbone contributor than what you would be saying for the same question in our, <laughs> so. <laughs> um, right. So, yeah, let me quickly go through the slide because I also had talked with operators, you know, after this, uh, uh, the deprecate stuff and about, you know, oh, we want ASM and SSM, right? So, so the, the, this stuff is related, right? So, <clears throat> so the, the operators think they do not need to go through IGMP version 3 or MLDV2 as long as they do not need SSM. That is, you know, to some degree true, right? Um, so it would be good enough to stay with IGMP v2 and MLDV1, but they also get other benefits from MLDV2, uh, sorry, from IGMP v2. Okay, typo. From IGMP v3 and MLD, <laughs> bad typo, okay. Right, so one, for example, is the explicit tracking, which is one of these other issues where I think we also need to point out that, you know, these latest versions do provide short leaf latency, which in IPTV is extremely crucial. And then Ronald Charter, you know, martyr our brains, what beside SSM and explicit tracking were the other benefits that we get out of the latest version of the protocols, and that's basically something we could write down into an informational um, a draft in MBONE-D, basically, to go along with these uh, standard document uh, status changes. I think the main problem that I see all over the place is that people think IGMP version 3 is SSM only. Right, that's exactly, yes, issue. yes. So if we can have an RFC with 20 type bold font, that would certainly maybe the, be the best way to emphasize that that is not the question. I could, uh, your, your bullet there is a little misleading as well, um, Greg Cisco. Mm -hmm. It says, wrong, fully backward compatible can mix two and three. Well, you can do SS ASM without two. I mean, V3 supports ASM. 
It's not like you have to fall back to two or one to get ASM functionality. V3 supports right. ASM. Yeah, of course. It, I, well, it's just, it's confusing. Backward compatible, can mix V2, V3 routers, queries and hosts arbitrarily. It's like, yeah, you can, but you don't need to. You can do ASM with V3. I'm just giving right, you right. I, I think there is a point missing in the middle. Right, right? So that's my was point. You're going with the customer there. through it. The I'm last... trying to help you. Yeah, yeah no, of course, of course. Yeah. I'm here for you, Torlis. Yes. Thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, so, um, yeah, the, the, the midpoint, of course, you can perfectly go through to IGMP v3 and MLDV2 even if you have nothing on board uh, with AS, uh, with SSM because your intra domain, you use Spider PIM, whatever good stuff you want to do in your domain, um, don't stick to the old protocol version, right? And then also any mix should work. And now we've seen basically uh, problems in the past, and so I mean they've, that's operational experience that we, you know, in an M D draft may want to mention. Um, I would think that, uh, you know, my latest problems with IGMP v3 went away in something like 2010 when the last snooping switches uh, started to support it, right? So, I mean, if we have some timeline to, to really give more confidence to operators, uh, that would certainly be not uh, wasted. Right, so, and then of course also, when we are writing something operationally down, then an MBONDI document would be the place to state, you know, here are all the, the, the changes we've been doing and deprecating ASM interdomain, but we really want to have, you know, a full internet standard for intra-domain ASM. Um, <clears throat> and that's basically around, you know, the, the other draft I mentioned, right? So the deprecation interdomain. Um, <clears throat> and then, um, uh, these these recommend these these discussions right so intra domain is fine uh, binary pim is preferred uh, majority of uh, customers I would think the majority of multicast deployments overall if you just count customers would still be enterprises that are using pim sparse mode within the domain and then obviously all these things like there is a good range of application that could do SSM but we're not forcing you now but you know whenever there is an opportunity right so I think that. Uh, that statement should be made because that was exactly why operator called me and, and basically said he was, you know, afraid about, you know, the work that we're doing interdomain, really touching whatever he is doing. And then we got into all the IGMP V3 uh, discussion, that stuff. So how do we make the, you know, the majority of what we're still making money from unless an operator, a vendor is, is just selling to service providers, right? But if I look at these typical service uh, vendors that sell both to enterprises and service providers, we don't want to really, um, make uh, the the enterprises feel scared, um, and so that's this part. Next slide. Right. So now the the funny uh, protocol list, right? So RFC one 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 two, and so this is actually the only interesting uh, document. Everything else, I think, that we have on the list is just changing the status, right? So the bad ones downgrade, the good ones upgrade, right? Um, but RFC one 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 two is two things in one. On once, it is the actual specification of the ASM service model for which we actually never uh, built an IPv6 document. And of, of course, as we said, we don't want to deprecate the whole ASM service model, right? Even if the last step would be at some point in time, say, intradomain PIM sparse mode is not good, but intradomain uh, binder PIM is, I think, always going to be excellent for, um, you know, uh, the applications it's built for, right? So. You know, that's, this is the biggest challenge here. My proposal would really be to ref this and basically come up, you know, just strip out all the IGMP1 stuff, add IPv4, IPv6 in, in the rest, and that's going to be the new normative full internet standard for the ASM service mo model, right? That would be my proposal. Hopefully that's, that's something feasible because this is something like the holy grail of multicast, right? So upgrading RFC, so I would, would not would try that we don't touch any of the actual content there, just, you know, v4, v6, and get rid of all the IGMP v1 stuff. So um, then our, yeah, IGMP v2, right, downgrade, historic. I don't really know the process. I think the, the historic process, hopefully there's going to be an AD in the PIM working group and we can discuss that. Next slide. Um, yeah, IGMP v3 needs to be upgraded, I think, to full standard. Uh, uh, MLDV1 downgrade. Oh, there is a typo again. Sorry, this was all done quickly. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so um, MLDV2, of course, upgrade to full standard. Oh, Same okay. argument as IGMPV3. Yeah, that's V2, yeah. And, but you're talking for both standard for one as well? No, 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 no. Well, keep I, I, I'm just showing the current. Current status. So this, ah, is, this is the current. This is just the current, yeah. So upgrade, downgrade, upgrade. 
Yeah, yeah. So I mean, the upgrade and downgrade for all these documents is pretty obvious, right? So yeah. the old ones downgrade, the better ones upgrade. So 4604, that's SSM. That's the service model for V4 and V6 upgrade. Um, then um, we've got 3590. Um, we'll have to check if that is actually, you know, well adopted. So that seems to have been an addendum to um, IGMP v3 or MLD v2, I think. So we'll need to check that in more detail if that should become part of, you know, the catechism um, in, in, in full standard. Um, then we've got the most interesting one just, you know, from the status, and that's the lightweight IGMP v3, MLD v2, which is kind of removing the nasty bits from IGMP v2, uh, IGMP v3 and MLD v2, which is the um, exclude sources list, which we never really used. Um, so I have no experience about deployment stuff, if, but I would fear that, uh, that that's still far away from really being full standard, right? That's, that should probably stay proposed and we may want to continue to suggest to people, you know, to use it or not. At least it's part of the investigation group. Yeah, uh, stick here. So, yeah, so the interesting thing is when you want to make something on the internet standard, you actually look at the spec and you decide which parts have like wide implementation and interoperability and all of that. And you actually take stuff out of the spec that hasn't had, it, that is not nature enough. Um, In general, like we did that with, with PIM, we, we took, yeah. actually took some stuff out of PIM. But it's border, border. So you're saying we need to there. ref the document actually when we want to upgrade to full. Well, I think what you're getting at yeah. is, is 3590 may evolve to look like 5790 when it goes to standard. Yeah, so the thing is you have to go through like an implementation report and various things, yeah. deployment status. And it could be that we actually end up ripping that last okay. stuff out of it. But there are some deployments, so maybe we will find that there is insufficient deployment. I don't know yet. Well, I have no strong opinions, right? I'm happy if we don't have to go through the trouble of doing this stuff. Just if people stand up and feel strongly that this stuff has enough stuff, then I would obviously agree that we, you know, do the job on that as well. I'm, I'm more interested in what you were saying with respect to what's the process. I was hoping, yeah. looking at older documents that seem to have been updated from proposed to full standard after a while, but now you're saying we may need to ref the documents and yeah. throw stuff away. So yeah, that's a discussion for Pim. Yeah, right? basically look at the errata, see if there's issues to be fixed, <laughs> uh, probably do an implementation report, right. maybe a separate RFC like we did when we wrote a sparse mode. Right. There is one RFC that is like an implementation report. And then after that, we did like, uh, yeah. we took some stuff out of 46 so on to make the- Yeah, but that was a RFC. young junkyard. That was a 20 year junkyard, right? I feel a lot better about IGMP and MLD for that matter. Yeah, yeah so that makes the job easier, that's yeah. good. <laughs> the, uh, Jeffrey from Juniper. This is related to um, uh, Stig's comments, uh, or it's related to the uh, excluding sources. Um, if we upgrade the um, original uh, IGMP v3 and MLD v2 to full standard, then we need to decide if we want to remove the excluding sources function. Um, and I'm I was actually not aware of 5790. If the that lightweight uh, IGMP v3 and uh, MLD v2 is without the excluding sources, then we might as well just consider upgrading that 5790 to full standard. And that would be an interesting question, right? If I just take uh, IGMP v3, MLD v2, and basically try to change the text to say that, you know, the exclude list must be empty, right? What difference would that be over 5790? Because I've, I, 5790 rewrote everything, right? Um, and so that's going to be hard comparison. Maybe that's, that's one of the tough jobs to do because I would agree that if we need to ref anyhow and eliminate stuff that hasn't been used, it would be exactly that, you know, exclude list having anything more than an empty list, right? Mm -hmm. So if, if that's the thing we could do to basically say, oh, we don't need 5790, we're just removing the exclude list, but there may be other protocol simplifications that 5790, so we'll need to check the authors list and figure out mm -hmm. if any one of them is willing to, to, to help with the effort. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, when this stuff happened, uh, I was on the position, of you know having worked in a vendor that had spent a humongous amount of time to get the full versions of the protocols implemented, so there was little interest from our side to basically fix this. So now, basically, with a lot of time gone, and we're trying to do the best for the IETF, let's see how we can deal with that. Um, yeah, I'm just seeing how it was. <laughs> no, you've revealed way more than you should have, but that's okay. 
No, that's, for, for what that, it's worth, it's Juniper, this, we did the same thing. We yeah. started with a lightweight version of it before it was a lightweight version of it, and we just did include mode. And right. then later, yeah, yeah. we yeah. spent an enormous amount of effort doing the whole thing. Yeah. And only to. Not yeah. Um, another question is about uh, uh, V1. If we idea. upgrade the V3 to full standard, do we have to downgrade the V1 to historic? Can we just leave it alone? Why not to downgrade? V1 and V2 to historical. I think uh, uh, Tori said uh, uh, had a concern that if we downgrade to historical, then the, we lose the definition for the uh, ASM yeah, service. Yeah, but remember, RFC 1112 doesn't even talk about IPv6. We have no normative document for the ASM service model in V6. So I think yeah. it would be definitely good to to ref, you know, the you know split 1112. You know, or just extract from 1112 the service model, which is the 50%, then comes the IGMP with one spec. So we'll just take the first part, add V6 to it, something like that. Well, so even if, if we didn't do it's any of the things at all, what was well, wrong? Well, we just don't have, uh, we don't have a standard, um, a full standard definition of the ASM service model for V6. So if you want to do ASM, do V4, yeah, sure. I mean, some people might like that. But again, if I want to defend, you know, the poor enterprises that can perfectly well do IPv6, BIDER, PIM, ASM, what's their reference? Um, or, or maybe there's no one doing V6 multicast in the enterprise. No, I don't think that's true. I think, you know, the enterprises, uh, as much as anybody else, are moving to V6 on the timeline that they can afford, right, in terms of if the vendor and running multicast. Yeah. Uh, so stay just a quick comment to Jeffrey. So uh, we don't have to touch anything else in order to move that to full standard or internet standard. It's up to us whether we want to deprecate or whatever version one. That's a different discussion. Is what, sorry? Whether we want to touch version one, like deprecated or whatever. That's a yeah. separate discussion. There's nothing automatic. We can yeah. make the new one sure. internet standard without touching it. Yeah. Uh, Mankamna, Cisco system. Uh, I just wanted to add one more document to your list, which is IGMP snooping. I think even that RFC is still informational, so maybe it will be good to make it as a standard. So that the information on that one wasn't because it's not widely deployed or so, but because it's doing things implicitly. It's not changing anything on the wire. And there are basically these ITF policies that are saying, show me differences on the wire, uh, then we can make it standard. Now, we're actually having the same discussion with the explicit tracking, where the changing on the wire is uh, basically that traffic flows faster or, you know, stops faster. And IGMP snooping obviously does the same thing. But, you know, uh, IGMP snooping has this smell of a layer two solution. That is, you know, so that's a totally different discussion. We can have that again with the area director and see if something has evolved, but the information was because of that. Sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? It's a good discussion. Thanks, Torlis. Yeah, Adjacent you'll work? You'll be presenting. Yeah, I'll, I'll, the, the, we'll repeat this because it was so cool <laughs> in an hour. <laughs> Very good. All right, cool. Who's got the blues? Blue sheets. Everyone sign the blue sheet. Sure. Anyone sign not them. sign the blue sheet? Yeah. Sign them. Um, yeah. So uh, we uh, PIM will be back in this room, and it starts in 20 minutes. So if you'd like, you can stay here. No one will be kicking you out. Um, uh, but come on back in 20 minutes for PIM. Uh, other than that, M Bone D is adjourned. We'll see you in. Bangkok. So Pim Pim starts in twelve minutes.